Greetings from Luxembourg. I'm here for work, uh, which is, I guess, unusual with my travel videos. Usually I'm in a different place visiting for fun, for leisure, for exploration and curiosity purposes, but I'm here for work. Uh, and as some of you guys know, for, if you've been subscribed long enough, usually when I visit a new place, I make a gay dating in that place video, right? So I was planning on making a gay dating in Luxembourg video, a gay dating in Budapest video because I was there for work as well right before Luxembourg. Um, and I, I have not created those videos just because I've been busy with work, but also I feel like with trips, there's like two kinds of trips. There's trips where for whatever reason, you're, it's high energy, you wanna explore, you're, you wanna see who's out there. I've had trips that were like 48 hours long. I remember being in London years ago for 48 hours and in 48 hours I, I managed to have a, an incredible date with this guy I met from Tinder. I met another guy at a bar and we hung out again while I was there for 48 hours for two days. And then other times you just feel kind of disconnected and withdrawn. I remember when I went to Turkey for like two to three weeks. Uh, I want to say was that the same year? No, it was the year after, right before the COVID pandemic 2019. And that trip, I didn't want to meet anybody. I didn't, I didn't, I, I just kind of stayed to myself, did the walking around all day thing. But like, sometimes you just don't want to connect with people. And you, at least for me, I go into introvert mode. And this week has been a little bit, not a little bit, I have been totally introverted this week, other than obviously needing to do stuff for work, meeting with colleagues here um, in Europe. And so I've been kind of off the radar. And I think part of the reason is this story that I'm about to share that was like kind of triggering for me. Um, and it's it's ironic and it's kind of like a full circle story because at the time of this video, just a few days ago, uh, abortion was made illegal in Texas, in the United States. And obviously it's been this huge, you know, hugely controversial thing. Uh, a lot of people feel it's a step backwards. And one of my friends reached out and was like, you should just stay in Europe. It's a mess here, what's happening in the States. And the day she texted that message was the day that this story I'm about to share, uh, or the day after this story I'm about to share happened. And so the full circle sort of moment for me is like, the grass is always greener. Like I am one of those people who assumes in Europe, things are more modern ahead of the, the curve and really, this story I'm about to share has reminded me of how we all live in bubbles. In every place in the world, you have pockets of bubbles. And when you're in your bubble, you forget that there's other bubbles where people think completely differently, interpret things totally differently. And it's not about nationality or culture. At the end of the day, there's people who think like you everywhere and there's people who don't think like you at all everywhere. So, so this story. So. As I mentioned, I've been kind of in introvert mode all week. And part of that has been because I have felt very disconnected from the colleagues that I've met here, which is weird because I'm half French and half Turkish. So I actually thought I would really click with the, my um, international colleagues here. And some of them I have, some of them there's definitely, it's easier to converse about certain things, but then with others, there's like a total disconnect and I went to this happy hour um, a few days ago for work and the, the conversations were just so surface and so small talk. And I was actually shocked because Luxembourg is, in my mind, an international place, right? It's one of these tiny little countries uh, and I'm in Luxembourg, the city within Luxembourg. So Luxembourg, comma Luxembourg, kind of like New York, New York. Um, and I just assume this is like, you know, a wealthy place. So there's a certain level of access to education. Uh, a lot of people here are immigrants, right? They're expats. It's, it's Luxembourg is so small that you, you, you never meet people from Luxembourg, right? So the people I work with here have other origins typically and just happen to live in Luxembourg. But there was like zero sort of like chemistry that I felt with my colleagues. And I felt like there was just a total disconnect, a lack of, a total lack of interest or curiosity in my life as a, as a visitor, as, as a multicultural person, as a person who lives in the States. And I'm normally that curious person who will ask other people about their life and their experiences. But because I was feeling that energy that wasn't that like inquisitive or intrigued, 
I was so drained from the whole week of these work events that I just like kind of sat there at the happy hour, minding my own business, drinking my beer and not really engaging much. And then at a certain point, I did start to talk to this guy who was way more chatty and and conversational. So I was like, oh, this is like I'm willing to invest in this conversation. It was a mistake. So this guy, I don't know how we got to this conversation, but I think we were talking about cultural differences uh, as immigrants. And he was telling me how um, he doesn't understand how like racism is such a big deal in America. So that was my first, I guess, red flag, right? That I'm listening to a white, a clearly white man telling me about how he thinks like racism is not a, really a big deal and he doesn't get why it's like a thing in the United States and that, you know, he experiences racism all the time as a white person. <laughs> so I am not about um, like breaking people down and, and like being confrontational. I would rather have an intellectual conversation and like really get to the heart of like what somebody like that is really trying to say or like why they have come to this conclusion that this is how they interpret things. So I basically was sort of using reverse psychology in this conversation to hopefully get him to the conclusion that he doesn't actually know what he's talking about. Of course, I'm sure that at times in his life, he has been treated differently because of the way he presents himself, because of his skin color. Like that can happen to anybody across the board. But I was trying to explain to him that racism is not really like typically 99% of the time, it's not like somebody in a KKK gown chasing a black guy, you know, down the street in the States, right? In America, it's like microaggressions. It's daily things that will happen that are subtle, small, but it's like death by a thousand paper cuts, right? It's like consistent things that are always there under the surface, right? Whether it's getting stared at at a store or getting stared at you know, uh, on the train. So I was trying to explain this to him and to try to really uh, connect the dots. I told him about the story in the Bahamas that I made a video about a few weeks ago where it wasn't like somebody called me a faggot, but it was this like underlying tension that everybody in the room could feel, or at least all the women in, in the room were perceptive to it. And it's just this energy that's like, you're like this, you feel uncomfortable and you, it's almost like it triggers that fight or flight response in you. And I was trying to connect the dots and by, by telling him a, a personal story that was analogous to the race conversation. And it went totally over his head. And instead of getting it, his first reaction to that story, for those of you who, who remember that video, um, his first reaction was, oh, well, I knew the second I met you, you were gay. I mean, from a mile away, the first time I saw you on a video call, I mean, you're like a California gay, you know, you're <laughs> so I'm like a California. What does that even mean? I don't live in California. I mean, yes, right now, as of the past few months, I have these highlights. So so that I can understand is is a California gay thing. But I'm like, what does this even mean? Right. So I'm now kind of like digging to see a what he means and b is this guy really gonna dig his own grave? And boy, he dug the whole six feet down. We're talking and he's like, well, you know, it's your mannerisms, you're you're very feminine, you know? And, and it's just so obvious to me. And so this kind of conversation, and, and it's ironic that what I was trying to tell him is exactly that moment. Like that moment is demonstrative of what I was trying to tell him, which is that that's not a daily occurrence that somebody will just say that to me very bluntly. But it's a consistent thing that in life, as I become more comfortable with myself as a human being, as a gay person and so on, every once in a while, somebody will feel the need to say these things that obviously for most gay men are a huge trigger. Like it's very triggering to be told, literally, you're not, you're not really a man, like you're not really, you're not masculine in any way, right? And for me, as somebody who comes from a mixed background, it's very similar to when I'll tell people I'm half Turkish and half French, and they will feel the need to tell me, oh, I don't really see the Turkish, or I don't really see the French. Like, people feel very comfortable telling you about yourself um, when it's not really, like, 
I'm not seeking their approval, right? Or, the, or their validation of my existence or my identity. And so ironically, that was the point I was trying to raise to him that when you're in a minority group uh, or a group that's like marginalized or whatever, it's not always overt somebody trying to like, you know, bully you, but it's these things that people will say that make you constantly sort of question your identity and how you present yourself to society. And any, other than being a narcissist, I think any human being, after that happens your entire life, especially from childhood, it affects you because you're constantly assessing who you are and how you present yourself to the world. And, and some people who don't have that experience, like this guy who was telling me all this, I think it's very difficult for them to understand that that's something, if it's happened to you enough times in life, it has an effect on you. It's not just about confidence versus lack of confidence. It's it's a part of your self-image and, and your identity. It's like a reminder that brings you back to childhood of worrying about what people think because you it's been drilled into your head that you're not supposed to be that thing. Or there's certain things that you're not supposed to be and there's certain things that you are. And the California gay thing, what he meant, because I didn't know what he meant at first, he was trying to say that I come from a culture, meaning the States, where it's so okay to be gay that I have felt comfortable becoming a stereotype, which is actually not at all accurate. Um, and so again, I think it's so interesting that people like this totally miss the nuances of, like he knows nothing about my background. So I was trying to explain to him, half of my family's Turkish, uh, half of my family is is Muslim, and in his mind, somebody like him, that automatically doesn't fit the narrative of what he believes the gay experience is versus the Muslim. Like in his mind, that could not be compatible, right? So I was trying to bring up these nuances to make him realize like, you're just assuming things because of where I live, which is really, really ignorant, right? Um, and he doesn't know anything about my childhood of like being that typical gay kid who felt the need to adjust his behavior in order to not get bullied or in order to not be ostracized by parts of my family. So it was a very triggering conversation, but I believe in having those difficult conversations because if nothing else, it's informing me on how people see me on a video call, let's say, working with me professionally, working with me professionally, like I would want to know if people are harboring these feelings internally within five minutes of talking to me. So what's interesting is the more this guy kept drinking, the more I started realizing he has his own complexes about sexuality. He mentioned that he's had a few gay experiences, but like he's not gay. And uh, at a certain point in the night, I caught him telling a coworker, we have some gays here, so you need to be careful, something along those lines. And then that guy, that coworker later in the night, who's Dutch, was telling me about Amsterdam, like it's a really great city, blah, blah, blah. But like me as a gay person, I would have to be careful if I were to go to the countryside. So in my head, this whole event, I'm rolling my eyes internally. I'm like, wow, these people are so sequestered and they're so... I almost felt like I was being talked to as if I'm a child who's who's just born, who's just been put out into the world and who needs a lot of guidance from these total strangers who, in my mind, it's like, I feel like I handled that situation with, uh, w with grace. And so it's ironic, right, that I'm being told how I would need to behave by people who don't even know how to behave with somebody they're just meeting for the first time, right? So the irony is not lost on me. Of course, the whole time I was like, this is like, this is like, you know, so, so silly on so many different levels. But the lesson for me was, wow, in my mind, in Luxembourg, this place that's multicultural, that, that has a, a huge immigrant population, expat commu community, um, and just in Europe in general, we, I think in the States, we often think of Europe as more liberal. But really, every place has certain things, right, where they're more progressive. And other things, in this case, like the social cues, the, the cultural elements, there was a total lack of understanding of people different than who they are used to being around locally, in this case, in Luxembourg. And it's so funny to me that this guy who told me you're very feminine, all this stuff, he kept using the buzz phrase of, 
you know, as a cisgendered white man. He kept using that phrase. And I'm always really suspicious of people who use these buzz phrases in the same way that whenever I hear somebody use the phrase, who's not black, use the phrase African-American. I'm always like, my ears always perk up a little bit because I don't know any black people who call themselves African-American in America. They just call themselves black. Anytime people use these buzzwords, I feel like it's a way for them to think they're, they're advanced, they get it, they're woke. But if you're really woke, you don't feel the need to use these buzzwords. You just show basic empathy, openness, curiosity without saying things that are clearly demonstrative of a lack of exposure or lack of willingness to understand other people's experience that's distinctly different from yours. So I went home that night. By the way, this event, I was kind of like required to go. Like the whole time, even from the start, I just wanted to go home. It was a long week. As I said, I, I felt disconnected from the people around me in general. So all I wanted to do was go home, but I felt like required to go to this event. So by the end of this event, I was so drained, so wanted to go home and as I'm looking out right now out the window, it's raining and it just feels like I'm in a movie. Like everything is matching the mood of this like isolation and, and you know, just feeling, uh, I don't know, whatever the equivalent of sleepless in S Seattle is. Lethargic in Luxembourg, maybe. As a gay person, I'm sure you guys can relate to this. You have these moments where you're reminded by the people around you or by society that like you are an outsider at the end of the day. And... It's a reminder that, yeah, in America, certain things are happening right now with Texas, the, the Texas abortion law, but really everywhere in the world, you're in a bubble. And when you're taken out of that comfort zone, it's a stark reminder of you don't belong here. And, and you can explain yourself in an eloquent, polite, non-combative way. And some people just have these walls these, these blinders where they're completely unable to, to leap over. And the fact that he mentioned his own little things that I was like, mm, there might be some sexuality sort of complexes here. Um, so I, I'm aware that that was, that's maybe a, a, a bigger conversation and maybe he has, maybe he was projecting a little bit. I don't know. But at the end of the day, that he is a great example of somebody who is maybe smart intellectually but in terms of understanding people's experience, there's a limitation there. And that kind of person exists everywhere. So as people who are gay or, you know, ethnic communities, whatever you, you want to call it, I don't know what the solution is because you want to learn about other people and you, you want, or at least I want to be, I'm curious about what other people think. But experiences like this make me feel very isolated and very, it's very exhausting to be reminded that you're an outsider and to, to a certain extent, you will always be an outsider to a group of people that you're around. And in this case, these are colleagues. So it's, it's not even like, all right, well, you can go home and never interact with these people again. Like there's a part of you that will always have to engage with people who are basically telling you, I am already seeing you as like a one dimensional person from the jump that is i've already identified you and i already sort of have all these prejudices about you already and i'm not sure what the solution is for people like us to deal with this like i told my friend this story and he was like you need to report this to hr that is so inappropriate but my whole thing is i don't think anybody learns from that because he would then feel even more validated in his experience and then that would make other people who agree with him feel that somebody like me is a villain who, who who's, uh, you know, like a, a snowflake or whatever. And there's always going to be people like this. I would rather be a part of the solution of like re-educating society. But just this conversation alone was so, to me, was so taxing, like emotionally. It was like draining to to try to connect with somebody and to be completely unable to penetrate that that barrier, that 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 
that that ignorance. This trip is almost over, so uh, in a few days I'm going back home to Miami, and I'm I'm thrilled. And I will say one good thing about when you experience things like this, right, is it makes you value hopefully where you live more. Um, Miami is not a perfect place. Miami is not a place that people associate with intellectual stimulation and people being super cultured. But what I will say is Miami, just like LA before that, just like New York City before that, these are places where people tend to be more open and more, they're just more open-minded about people who are different than them because these are hubs where there is a diversity, ethnically, culturally, socioeconomically, in terms of sexuality, gender. I think sadly for the next like 50 to 100 years, the only solution is that people like us have to live in these huge uh, cities that are known for being more progressive. Like, otherwise you just are constantly <laughs> triggered, I guess, by things that happen. What do you guys think about this?